For generations, people have wondered about the Earth. How have we affected the world that is our home? Did the land use of ancient civilizations hasten their fall? And what legacy is modern industrial society leaving for future inhabitants of the Earth? Join us for a look at how humanity has shaped the Earth and its atmosphere. We'll examine the decline of ancient Egypt, investigate the threat of the ozone hole, and find out how both are significant for our world as it nears the 21st century. The home planet, this time on the Miracle Planet. From space, the clouds above the Earth trace delicate patterns over land and sea. Below, the pattern of human activity marks the surface of the planet. In the barren lands of the Sahara Desert, there is a strange grouping of circles. Each circle is a field, irrigated with water from wells deep beneath the desert. In the Sudan, farmers draw water from the Nile to grow their fields of cotton. This patchwork of farmland is part of an immense agricultural project which combines thousands of acres under unified management. Each of the green rectangles is nearly two miles long. On the other side of the globe, similar projects have also made an impact on the landscape. These mile-wide circles are irrigated plots in the desert of eastern Oregon. Farming is not the only human activity visible from space. In many parts of South America's Amazon jungle, deforestation has become an obvious surface feature. In this satellite image, the red represents bare logged areas. They're expanding year by year as the forest is being destroyed along the branching network of roads. Even from 120 miles in space, it is evident that humans have become a major environmental force all over the Earth. We humans have made a great impact on our world in a relatively short time. Hello, I'm Bill Curtis for the Miracle Planet. In just a few thousand years, we have grown powerful enough to affect the global environment. From the upper atmosphere to the ocean floor, from the great deserts to the tropical rainforests. Of all creatures on Earth today, Homo sapiens will have the greatest influence on the future of our planet. But against the backdrop of Earth's long history, people have lived on this planet for only a brief moment. To appreciate the contrast between our short stay on Earth and our extensive impact on the environment, we must return to the early days of our planet. Four and a half billion years ago, meteorites rained down on the surface of the newborn Earth. The heat of their impacts and the internal heat of the planet released vast quantities of water vapor into the primeval atmosphere. When the planet finally began to cool, the water condensed and fell as rain. The rainwater collected into vast oceans, which eventually covered the Earth.
It was under the protective blanket of the sea that life was born nearly four billion years ago. The first forms of life produced oxygen as a waste product. But eventually, living creatures developed which needed oxygen. Life began to evolve rapidly, becoming increasingly complex. The oxygen accumulating in the seas gradually escaped into the air, where it radically transformed the atmosphere above the Earth. The oxygen reacted with sunlight to form a thin layer of ozone high above the Earth. The ozone began to protect the land against ultraviolet radiation, making it possible for life to emerge from the sea. 400 million years ago, green plants spread along the shores of the Earth. Gradually, the continents were covered with vegetation. The Carboniferous period was a time of gigantism, when huge ferns grew nearly 100 feet high, and dragonflies measured two feet across. This period, which lasted more than 60 million years, was a time of global transformation. The climate of the Earth was changing, as were the positions of the continents. 200 million years ago, Africa and India split apart from the ancestral continent, Pangaea. Gradually, the Carboniferous swamps filled with sediment from countless generations of decaying plants. They would become the storehouses for the coal and oil we use today. During the most recent geologic epoch, glaciers replaced swamps as a distinctive feature of the North American landscape. And at least 10 times during the last million years, glaciers have expanded to cover a significant portion of the globe. These ice ages have witnessed the extinction of many species and rise of others. Among the creatures which have prospered in the wake of the most recent ice age are human beings. This drawing of a wild goat called an ibex was painted on a cave wall near Cognac, France, approximately 20,000 years ago. wall nearby, some of the ancient artists left their own marks. These are handprints. They record the efforts of individuals who stood here at the dawn of Homo sapiens. At that time, the human population of the Earth was relatively small, perhaps fewer than five million. But even then, people were beginning to reshape the face of the planet. During the Neolithic period, people began to make significant changes in their world, establishing communities like this one near the Dead Sea at Jericho. These are the remains of the walls of Jericho, excavated by archaeologists. About 2,000 people once lived in the ancient city, considered one of the world's oldest settlements. Its economy was based on agriculture, judging by the wealth of farm implements found at the site. This mortar and pestle was used to grind wheat into flour for the families who came together to live and work within the walls.
This rare sickle, crafted of bone and stone, was probably used to harvest grain from the fields outside the town. Agricultural communities spread slowly from the Middle East to neighboring regions, including what is now the Sahara Desert. Even in the central Sahara, we find evidence that people farmed these lands several thousand years ago. A herd of cows has been skillfully carved into the desert cliff. Wild animals that once roamed the area are depicted as well. This giraffe is rendered in life-size. We know from these carvings that the Sahara was once much wetter than it is today. In those days, a broad green savanna covered what is now the world's largest desert. The sands, which seem so eternal, are in fact transient. They come and they go, driven by long and short-term climate changes. The current spread of the desert is linked to long-term global climate changes following the last ice age, although humans have accelerated the natural process of desert expansion. As the rains fell less and less often along the North African coast, the Sahara Desert spread south, west, and east. More and more, the expanding desert forced tribes of farmers into fertile river valleys. The Bible relates an account of these migrations in the first book of Moses. The ancestors of the Israelites left a dying landscape and journeyed to the valley of the Nile. While the desert was spreading, the Nile Valley remained green and fertile. Around the Nile, this influx of immigrants helped provide both the skilled craftsmen and slave labor that built one of the world's first powerful civilizations, the Egyptian Empire. The pyramids, erected around 2500 BC, were majestic monuments to Egyptian god kings. They represent the great golden age of the ancient Egyptian empire. But it was also a time when great damage was done to the Nile River Valley. The famous Sphinx of Giza symbolizes the pharaoh Shephron in the form of the sun god Ra. When it was built, the Egyptian landscape appeared much different than today. The desert sands had not yet reached the base of the pyramids. In this fertile valley, the Egyptians began using the waters of the Nile to irrigate their fields. Under the authority of the increasingly centralized Egyptian state, the trees were felled and the marshes drained for farmland. The pharaohs conquered the people of many nations, expanding their empire. They would use the newly acquired workforce to conquer the land as well. This bas relief from the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh depicts a large-scale agricultural scene along the Nile thousands of years ago.
It was this rich farming society that built the powerful civilization symbolized by the pyramids. When the pharaohs ruled, irrigation was practiced on a wide scale. Marshes were drained and trees cut to make room for more and more farmland. But even as the ancient Egyptian civilization reached its zenith, the desert was encroaching on the edges of the Nile Valley. Eventually, intensive agriculture depleted many fields, crops would no longer grow, and the rich black land gradually degenerated into the red land of the desert. From ancient times, it seems that human civilizations have affected and sometimes severely altered the natural environment that, at first, had sustained them. The Mediterranean Sea has witnessed many civilizations since the ancient Egyptian Empire. The cultures of Greece, Carthage, Rome and Byzantium flourished for thousands of years among the blue waters and sun-drenched islands. This was the cradle of Western civilization. Today we know these vanished civilizations much the way we know the ancient Egyptians, from ruins, like the Temple of Poseidon in Greece. Archaic temples are not the only ruins left by the ancients of the Mediterranean. They also left a legacy of land exhaustion and desertification that is still evident thousands of years later. Only ruins remain of Ephesus, an ancient Greek city in what is now Turkey. During the fourth century BC, its wealth was proverbial, and its temple to Artemis was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. This amphitheater, with a seating capacity of 24,000, gives a hint of the glory of ancient Ephesus. Long ago, this was a magnificent library. Scholars gathered here from cities all around the Aegean to study science and medicine. St. Paul came to this Mediterranean port to visit one of the earliest Christian congregations. Ephesus was a center of learning and culture in the ancient world. But in the end, Ephesus declined into obscurity, partly as a result of its own success. In fact, History rarely provides such a clear example of how human action affects an environment. Soil samples from the region may shed some light on the fate of Ephesus. Each sample contains pollen from plants and trees that once lived here. The core samples were taken at different depths and correspond to various time periods in the natural history of the region. Researchers have been reconstructing the stages of Mediterranean civilizations by studying changes in plant life over a 4,000 year period. Because each type of plant produces a unique form of pollen, soil samples provide valuable clues to the vegetation of ancient times. Following the evidence of the pollen, we can trace the evolution of the environment around Ephesus. This is a microscopic view of wheat pollen. It was found in a soil sample dated 2,000 years ago. 
Many samples from the region indicate that wheat pollen was common in the soil when Ephesus was at its zenith. From the grain, bread was made to feed the growing population of this coastal trading center. At that time, wheat was commonly grown on the hills around the city. The upland fields near the mountains must have been widely cultivated, but even these fields would probably not have provided enough grain for the city's peak population. But the land was not always heavily cultivated. Earlier, another type of plant dominated the hillsides. In soil samples from this period, the pollen of plantain is common, while wheat pollen is rare. Plantain is a grass typically found in open fields and pasture lands of the European continent today. From this, we can deduce that goats and sheep probably grazed on the land around Ephesus before the fields were plowed and planted with wheat. Further back in time, the pollen of yet another plant predominates in the soil samples. 4,000 years ago, the pollen of oak trees was very common. This indicates that prior to the arrival of people, oak woodlands covered the land that would become Ephesus. By analyzing pollen grains, it becomes apparent that the environment of Ephesus changed from forest to pasture to farmland over a 2,000 year period. These changes were caused by human actions intended to make the land more productive. But ultimately, they contributed to the ruin of a thriving port city and the land that supported its people. A fatal mistake at Ephesus was interrupting the natural water cycle. Before the arrival of people and the founding of the small village that became Ephesus, the seasonal rains fell on wooded slopes. Some of this moisture quickly evaporated or ran into rivers and streams, but a great deal was retained by the forest. Slowly, over many months, this stored moisture was released, moderating the difference between the wet and dry seasons. But when the forest was cleared for pasture, a rapid change began to occur in the natural environment. The grassland could not retain as much of the rain, so more water was released as runoff. Lacking the protection that was once provided by the forest, the soil began to erode. This process accelerated when pastures were plowed and planted with crops like wheat. Eventually, barren, infertile land was all that remained from what had been a forest on the hills around Ephesus. This was just the beginning of the environmental problems Ephesus caused for itself. Erosion carried soil down the Caister River, threatening the city's deep harbor with accumulating sediment. In the Roman era, the flow of sand and silt reached its peak, causing many inlets to silt up and clog. As the centuries passed, the effects of deforestation, grazing, and farming took their toll on the city's waterway. At least four times, the city was relocated closer to the mouth of the bay. But despite repeated dredging, the harbor was too shallow by the 9th century AD to accommodate the Byzantine fleet, and Ephesus declined into obscurity. Like the hills around Ephesus, this coastal region of the Mediterranean was once covered with vegetation. Here too, deforestation has been a major factor in creating a barren landscape. But this is only the first stage in the continuing process of desertification. 
The problem of erosion is worsened by large herds of goats and sheep that roam the logged hills. Because they're sure-footed, these hardy animals can live on slopes too steep for cattle. They graze the sparse vegetation down to the roots. When large herds overgraze a hillside, the ground cover is destroyed, and gradually the desert claims the land. Even with the resources of modern civilization, it's easier to degrade green woods and fields than it is to reclaim the desert and make it bloom again. The tragic decline of Ephesus is only one instance of what can happen when humans radically alter the environment without considering the consequences. Around the Mediterranean, the process of deforestation, overgrazing and farming has repeated itself over the centuries. The need to replace depleted natural resources may have been one of the factors that drove Roman civilization north into barbarian Europe. Conquering Roman legions crossed the snow-capped mountains of the Alps, established garrisons as far north as England. The Imperial Romans found scattered barbarian settlements secluded in a vast realm of virgin forest. The rich wilderness must have seemed like an endless source of natural wealth to the Mediterranean cultures, which were facing depleted resources at home. And so the Romans began their move north, into the fertile forest land of oak and beech and spruce. As the Roman Empire declined, missionaries and migrants brought with them their new religion, Christianity. Christian communities began to spring up all over Europe. Trees were cut and the foundation laid for the first building, often a small church in the middle of a forest. Then by cutting more trees, enough land would be opened up to enable people to begin farming. Soon more and more villages dotted the countryside. Over the centuries, the village would become a town, and perhaps even a city. Nerdlingen in West Germany is one such village. This modern town began as a small settlement in the forest. The church at the center of the village is encircled by houses. Surrounding them, the town wall stood as the main defense against marauding enemies. Inside this protective circle, the people of Nerdlingen prospered. To support the towns, farmlands were cleared beyond the walls. Trees were cut and fields plowed as the farms expanded into the surrounding country. Once again, the process of deforestation and the grazing of animals increased, this time in a more northerly setting. In Paris, the Cathedral of Notre Dame stands on an island in the Seine River. On this site, the early Christian settlers built a church in the sixth century. The great cathedral was constructed later as the city of Paris grew up around it. Today, Notre Dame is surrounded by a great metropolis that spreads out to the horizon. This is a satellite image of modern Paris. The red area with the Seine winding through it represents the heart of the city. Small areas of dark green around the outer margin are what is left of the forest. The great forests around Paris were long ago cut down and cleared to support the growing city. Berlin presents a similar satellite image, with an important exception. Like Paris, it began as a dense European forest. By the end of the 18th century, most of the surrounding timber had been felled. But today, dark green patches are scattered in the surrounding countryside. They are evidence of the popular concern over deforestation that has prompted the planting of many new trees. London provides a much bleaker picture. 
The city spreads broadly on both sides of the Thames. There is less green evident here than either Berlin or Paris. The tall trees around the capital of this island nation have long since been cut down. Taken as a whole, the Europeans have followed the same path as the Romans, the Greeks, and the Egyptians. Like its predecessors, European civilization has caused tremendous environmental damage. But unlike those before, it postponed the natural consequences by expanding its reach to truly global proportions. From the Mediterranean to Europe and on to America, the search continued for land to clear and untapped natural resources to fuel the expansion of Western civilization. Today, the island of Manhattan is forested not with native ash and oak, but rather with the concrete and steel towers that form the city's distinctive skyline. People pack into skyscrapers to work and live in America's largest city. But as the population increases here and around the world, the demand for natural resources has never been greater. In many ways, our culture resembles the civilizations of antiquity. We have cleared the prairies and forests for farmlands and sprawling cities. We demand ever more natural resources to fuel our factories and homes. From automobiles to plastics, our industrial society is based on the manipulation and consumption of fossil fuels. We've been extremely effective in our global search for coal and oil but we are rapidly depleting these natural resources. Tremendous buried reserves of coal and petroleum still remain in many regions of the world, but they are created very slowly. The natural formation of coal and oil requires millions of years and exceptional geologic circumstances. One place where it is possible to witness the coal of the future being created today is Okefenokee Swamp in Florida. Here, countless islands dot a vast marshland. Marshes like this were the scene of the tremendous plant growth that produced the coal people mine today. 350 million years ago, during the Carboniferous period, large areas of North America were submerged beneath a shallow sea with extensive marshes along the shores. Plant life in these shallow swamps was incredibly luxuriant. Huge ferns and fern-like trees, giant horsetails, club mosses, and primitive conifers grew thick in many regions of the world, including what is now the East Coast and Upper Midwest of the United States. A record of this era lies in the vast coal fields of Appalachia, Wales, and England, and the Saar Basin of continental Europe. Today, the conditions that produce these coal deposits can be found in the marshlands like the great Okefenokee Swamp. A core sample provides a record of the coal forming process that begins with dead plants. Over time, this partly decomposed matter settles on the swamp floor forming a black substance called peat. Every 20 years, a little less than half an inch of peat accumulates on the marsh floor. 
At Okefenokee, the peat bogs are 16 feet thick. This sample represents about 2,000 years of decomposing plant life. Beginning of the cypress swamp here, and pieces of wood, a forest, continuing, uh, continuing forest, uh, perhaps around 2,000 years ago, the beginning of a dry, very dry period, uh, many fires, pieces of charcoal. The cypress swamp was destroyed, and we ended up with a marsh. It was transformed into a marsh with aquatic uh, plants, no, no wood, no, only roots and, and fibers of aquatic plants. Over a very long time, coal gradually forms when peat is sufficiently compressed by the enormous weight and pressure of the growing deposits above. The Okefenoki is slowly making new fossil fuel, just as the ancient swamps formed the coal to fire the early furnaces of the Industrial Revolution. Today, the use of fossil fuels has spread to every facet of modern life. In the heartland of America, here in Nebraska, fossil fuels enable farmers to do everything from fertilizing, to harvesting, to pumping water for irrigation. Modern agriculture is extremely expensive, but it has allowed America and other developed countries to postpone the effects of environmentally destructive practices. In some areas of the American Midwest, an estimated bushel and a half of topsoil is lost for every bushel of corn produced under modern farming conditions. The soil of the Midwest is as deep as it is rich, but in the century and a half since the prairie was opened to the plow, in many areas, half of it has eroded away. Production has remained high, however, through the use of petroleum-based fertilizers and highly mechanized farming. Today, American agriculture is more costly and energy-intensive than ever before. Our society is dependent on the alchemy of energy more than any previous culture. We can transform crude oil from the Earth's crust into fuel, into clothing, and plastic products that crowd the closets of our homes. We burn enormous amounts of coal and oil to fire the engines of modern society. For the first several thousand years of civilization, people relied on simple, easily accessible energy sources. The old cultures were dependent upon farming and the natural productivity of the land. As the land failed, so did many ancient societies. But as modern civilization advanced, we developed new technologies and methods for tapping ever more resources. Today, each inhabitant of an industrialized country consumes as much energy in one day as a citizen of ancient Rome used in a year. As our populations increase and our cities grow, we manage to prolong the lifespan of our modern civilization through the consumption of great amounts of fossil fuels. It appears that we have overcome the limitations that faced earlier cultures. But we are only beginning to recognize the new limits that our society must face. The lights of streets and buildings illuminate this satellite view of the Great Lakes region of North America. Liberal consumption of energy has brought us a comfortable lifestyle, but it also suggests that modern civilization's impact is beginning to affect the whole Earth. Located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the Hawaiian Islands are far removed from the centers of modern civilization and pollution. Yet even here, among the clouds that cloak the peaks of Mauna Loa, the effects of civilization are being meticulously recorded. This is the Mauna Loa Marine Atmospheric Observatory. 
scientists have observed a gradual increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since observations began in 1958. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was around 280 parts per million. Now, it's nearing 350 parts per million. This trend could have a major impact on our world. In an effort to predict future global climatic conditions, Professor Manabe, a scientist working at Princeton University, uses a supercomputer. His theoretical program calculates how increasing levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide will affect the Earth. According to some projections, levels of carbon dioxide might reach as high as 600 parts per million by the middle of the 21st century. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere traps the sun's heat as it is released by the Earth's surface. An increase in carbon dioxide of this amount would raise the average temperature of the Earth four to eight degrees Fahrenheit. Manabe's computer simulation illustrates what might happen in North America if the average temperature rose by just a few degrees. As temperatures rise, surface evaporation would increase. Greater dehydration would occur in the inland areas. The region of heaviest impact would be on the broad grain belts of the American Midwest, where soil moisture could be reduced by 50%. Moreover, according to Dr. Manabe's computer simulation, the influence could spread across the whole Earth. Most regions in the Northern Hemisphere, except for India and Southeast Asia, would become drier. Prime agricultural regions in China, the Soviet Union, and Europe would be greatly affected. It's estimated that the productivity of these vast farming areas would be reduced by 20%. At NASA's Ames Research Laboratory near San Francisco, Scientists are monitoring the changing nature of the Earth's atmosphere. Regular flights are made into the stratosphere to sample the ozone levels in the upper limit of the atmosphere. Developed as a military reconnaissance plane, today this U-2 serves the purposes of science under the designation ER-2. Once the ER-2 leaves the ground, it climbs at an angle of 60 degrees. The plane has long, glider-like wings, enabling it to fly in the thin, high-altitude air. view from the cockpit at 12 miles above the earth is extraordinary. Outside, the temperature is 132 degrees below zero. The blackness of space borders the ethereal blue of the earth's upper atmosphere. Life cannot exist here. But this portion of the stratosphere is crucial to the existence of life on the continents below. This realm on the edge of space contains the ozone shield, which protects the surface of the Earth from deadly ultraviolet radiation. In the early days, the Earth was without an ozone layer.
For three billion years, the land was directly exposed to strong ultraviolet bombardment. Because ultraviolet rays destroy the materials necessary for reproduction, early life was restricted to the sea. Every organism, no matter how primitive, contains DNA, the genetic blueprint of life. The fragile DNA structure is destroyed easily when exposed to ultraviolet radiation. Early in the Earth's history, the waters of the oceans were the only barrier that protected this vital structure from the radiation. Therefore, the first living creatures were restricted to the water, and the continents remained desolate. The development of oxygen-producing organisms gradually brought about dramatic changes on Earth. Over billions of years, they released a great amount of oxygen into the water, which gradually dissipated into the air. As oxygen in the atmosphere increased, some of it reacted with ultraviolet light to create a layer of ozone in the upper atmosphere. By absorbing ultraviolet rays, the ozone layer made it possible for life to emerge from the water onto the land. Over the last two decades, a rapid change in the Earth's ozone layer has prompted increasing concern in the world's scientific community. At the University of California, Irvine, Professor Sherwood Rowland has been studying the effect of synthetic gases on the ozone layer. Collecting air samples from around the world, he analyzes them for chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs as they are called. CFCs are a class of inert compounds commonly used as refrigerants, aerosol propellant, and solvents. Because they are not broken down in the lower atmosphere, CFCs eventually rise into the stratosphere. There, they are broken down by sunlight, releasing chlorine. This chlorine, in turn, triggers a chain reaction that destroys large amounts of ozone. The equation is simple. The more CFCs, the less ozone. Roland's air samples come from places as diverse as the languages which mark their labels. But they all point to the same conclusion. Concentrations of CFCs are increasing throughout the world. Even in the Arctic and Hawaii, far from the great cities and industrial areas, levels of these gases are steadily rising. The ozone layer, although it does this protection for us, is really very thin. It's only about three parts in 10 million of the atmosphere are ozone. It's a very trace species. And it is formed all the time, and it is destroyed all the time. It's really very fragile. It, if we add other species which can attack the ozone layer, then we can easily change the amount of ozone that's in the atmosphere above us. The chief threat to the ozone layer in the present time is the release of chlorofluorocarbon molecules to the atmosphere. This means fluorocarbons 11, 12, and 113, which are used as aerosol propellants, in refrigeration, and in the case of fluorocarbon 113, the cleaning of electronics components. And the solution for this is that we should quit putting these molecules into the atmosphere. We need to find substitutes for all of them. Data from the Nimbus 7 research satellite indicates ominous changes occurring in the ozone layer over the South Pole. These images represent fairly normal ozone fluctuation until as recently as 1981. But during the early 1980s, changes became visible. 
the pink area in the center of the screen appears and continues to expand from year to year. The pink represents low ozone levels above the polar continent. Many scientists are alarmed at how rapidly the ozone hole has expanded. A significant change is apparently occurring in the Earth's atmosphere. It took over two billion years of evolution for primitive sea creatures to help create the oxygen-rich atmosphere we breathe today. Another billion years passed before there were land plants. Today, forests are among the major sources of oxygen in the atmosphere and are therefore vital to the ozone barrier. But today, both the forests and the barrier itself are under attack. The tropical forests are falling to widespread logging and continuing slash and burn agriculture, while the ozone layer is being depleted by human activity through atmospheric pollutants like chlorofluorocarbons. But like the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Ephesus, our tendency is to ignore these problems. It's easier to find new environments that will house us. In the Arizona desert, near Phoenix, there is a unique community. This is Sun City, home to nearly 50,000 people. A marvel of modern engineering, Sun City offers all the amenities of contemporary civilization in the midst of a hostile environment. It rarely is cloudy and almost never rains. And yet the city remains green because of tremendous amounts of water that are constantly pumped in. The natural temperatures frequently soar into the hundreds, but indoor air conditioning keeps residents cool. But despite its contemporary design, Sun City is an expression of one of the most ancient of human aspirations. This is the desire to control and modify the environment. The villages and farms of the Middle Ages were carved out of the vast woodlands of Europe. Now this city is spreading out into a hot and treeless land. But without the continued use of great amounts of energy, the desert would soon reclaim this man-made oasis. Sun City is an example of the technological power of modern civilization. But it's also an expression of the vulnerability that we have never been able to leave behind even when we escape the planet. We have ventured into space, sent probes to the farthest reaches of the solar system, and even walked on the moon. Already the dream of building colonies in space, which was once considered the stuff of science fiction, is close to becoming a reality. And yet space does not offer a good alternative to our home planet. It may be the last frontier, but space is hardly a welcoming environment. In practical terms, it is a vast and hostile place, where the slightest technical failure means death. The only welcoming world we know is this one, the planet Earth. Over billions of years, Earth has become a world of vast and intricate systems, of dense forests and barren deserts, of volcanic heat and glacial cold. The Earth is teeming with a million forms of life that have helped shape the very nature of our world, from the land under our feet to the air we breathe. The natural rhythms of the planet are beautiful and sure. Mountains rise, cool rains fall, Glaciers come and go in cycles as simple as the dawning and the setting of the sun. We are the custodians of this magnificent earth. We must use all our ingenuity to treasure and protect it. This is our home, the miracle planet. <laughs> 